Welcome, um, everybody. I think uh, we can already start quite on time. So it's a pleasure that uh, Tani Foyon and Hannes Woboda are participating today in our IRP talk on the Slovenian European Union presidency and its implications for the Western Balkan region. Um, I'm introducing Tanja Fayon. Uh, she's a member of the European Parliament and head of the Slovenian delegation of the Party of European Socialists. So welcome. And I also introduce Hannes Svoboda, who is president of the IIP, former MEP, and he also used to be chair uh, of the SD group uh, in the European Parliament. Um, today, our topic is the Slovenian presidency, and we know that now in July 2021, Slovenia will hold the presidency of the Council of the European Union for the second time. As we know, there is still um, the biggest issue will still be coping with the pandemic, uh, which was already the biggest challenge before for the predecessors of Portugal and Germany, with which Slovenia forms a trio to ensure also more consistent collaboration and also dealing with the priorities of the European Union, like Green Deal, rule of law, security. However, uh, next week in June, we're also remembering the breakup of Yugoslavia. And we also know that the Western Balkans uh, still face many challenges which are also related to its past. Reconciliation did not really sufficiently happen, borders are still disputed and nationalism is on the rise. Uh, on the other hand, we have a commission which declared that the um, orientation of the European Union should be a geopolitical one. And then we also see other old and new actors like um, China, Turkey, the Emirates and Russia being more active in the region and challenging also the European Union values-based approach. Nevertheless, um, the European perspective has not yet been contested, which is a good news. And Albania and North Macedonia were granted with the opening of accession talks in 2020 after going through fundamental reforms. However, still the ghost of the past continued to haunt the region. The youth is leaving the country in search for a prosperous life. Rule of law and press freedom is under pressure and non-papers are also circulating, challenging the status of the region since the end of the wars. So my first question would be to you, um, Tanya. How do you assess um, the biggest focus of the Slovenian uh, presidency. What are your expectations? Please. Thank you very much. Um, first, um, of course, it's a pleasure to be with you and to have the opportunity to discuss with you also with my very good um, former colleague and also friend Hannes Svoboda on the Slovenian presidency. It's the second time my country is having a presidency. First time our experience was in 2008. At that time, I was still a journalist correspondent in Brussels, so I was following, we are a small country, small administration. And at that time, we had the same prime minister as today, Anes Jansha, with his government administration. I have to say that the presidency at that time was, uh, for the first experience, um, a rather good one. Um, now, ahead of the new presidency, the expectations or feelings I share are mixed, if I'm honest. Mixed, why? Because um, in Brussels or in uh, among European uh, diplomats or European journalists, we are uh, facing some sort of um, not only criticism, but we are in focus of what is happening in Slovenia um, as regards the media freedom, uh, the rule of law, democracy, because we have a a lot of political interference in independent institutions. We have a, quite a political turmoil in our country. And uh, our prime minister is often fighting or quarreling through social media with a foreign or Brussels journalist, sometimes commissioners. And uh, recently we got a very critical report from OSCE uh, as regards the freedom of media. It seems like we are having um, a youngster's war against uh, the media in Slovenia. So. These are, of course, all the points that concern me ahead of the second presidency of Slovenia. Though we know, my experience is that with the presidency, we always inherit a big agenda. So next half a year, um, our presidency um, is based on four priorities under the slogan, uh, Together, a Resilient Europe. And uh, we will strive to facilitate what is very important, use recovery and reinforce um, resilience, um, reflect on the future of Europe. The conference has officially started on the 9th of May. 
and is expected to conclude in the spring 2020. So that will be extremely important too. Also, um, we'll try to strengthen the rule of law, which we are, um, it's, uh, it's a situation that we are among the countries that we are discussing uh, the rule of law in Slovenia, but also European institutions are critical towards the rule of law in Slovenia. So that will be important to follow and we'll try to increase security and stability in European neighborhood. What is on the um, agenda also among the priorities, and I'm really glad to see, is that special attention will be devoted to the Western Balkan countries and their future in Europe and the credible continuation of the EU enlargement process. And here we'll have a very demanding task. I, remember, I, I expect that we will discuss that a little bit later. But an unofficial date is that we will host the EU Western Balkan Summit in autumn. Date is around 6th of October. We'll have um, two bigger events in Slovenia. Of course, everything still a little bit depends on um, hybrid or pandemic situation and how much of the events we'll take in hybrid way. But at least um, what our ministers and the government um, is announcing is that they will try to do many events online as possible. So um, I don't know if I go much in detail, but this will be priorities of the presidency. Um, the agenda is in a main extent, of course, inherited as regards, I mean, or, or in line with the developments in Europe. We'll have to do everything to ensure that pandemic is finally behind us and that we will try to recover um, all the economic and social consequences. And of course, first um, tasks will be to assess the national um, action plans for resilience and recovery because Union is this time distributing a lot of money. I think it's a historical agreement on the European financial envelope, how much money will countries uh, get for the recovery and resilience. And uh, the council will have soon to assess this national uh, programs to see where the money goes, how the countries will struggle with the pandemic and the consequences. And this will be for surely um, the priority on the agenda for the next half a year. But luckily we were um, in trio with Germany and Portugal. So we have good allies around us and um, we started preparing uh, long ago. In the European Parliament, as I am a member for the third mandate, I can say that we are also eagerly waiting to see first the ministers and the prime minister to come to, to the parliament, to address the parliament. We didn't have a chance last time to hear, but this time to, I, I can imagine that will be a critical discussion. I don't exclude that. Also next week, we have a discussion in the parliament in the plenary session about the new office of European public prosecutor as Slovenia still didn't appoint as the last country to delegated prosecutor. So, we will most probably be again on the agenda in the negative way. And I wish that will not be often the case in the future. Thank you, Tanya. Hannes, what you've been hearing, Tanya has been saying a lot also about the internal focus, uh, which the presidents will probably focus on. Many of it is also inherited. And, uh, but what would be your expectations when it comes uh, to, to the Slovenian presidency? Maybe also we can already go into the topic, which is the main part also of our discussion is also the Western Balkan uh, European Union integration and also the hope uh, that, the, that the Western Balkan uh, enlargement process will be more on the agenda probably in the next half year. I mean, there is an, there's an, a summit upcoming. So what are your expectations when it comes to this? Well, uh, first of all, of course, uh, what uh, Tanya mentioned is very sad that we have also in Slovenia some tendencies we know from Poland, especially from Hungary. And it's interesting, uh, would be interesting to know why is uh, in some of the smaller countries this tendency growing. Now we have also in Austria some elements of uh, populism and uh, critical attitude towards uh, EU, but uh, of course not as strong. So it's more on the, on, let's say, um, trying to influence media before and not, on, not criticizing so much then and afterwards. Uh, nevertheless, of course, in the for Europe, uh, I hope that uh, the presidency will work well. We had it also in the past, even with Hungary and other countries, in that overall it worked uh, relatively well, at least 
Uh, I think the prime minister, hopefully, and the ministers will have to have uh, some sort of a, of a guideline to, uh, to not to be seen as uh, destroying uh, the European way, uh, especially during their presidency. Um, I just came from uh, Bratislava, where there was the Klopsek meeting, and one of the meeting was uh, with uh, the foreign ministers from Slovenia, from Croatia, and uh, from uh, Northern Macedonia, and uh, Mr. Lajcak, who is in some way a representative uh, of the EU for the Balkans. Um, uh, interesting, there was a very friendly and cordial uh, relationship between the ministers from Slovenia and, and uh, uh, Croatia. Uh, Tanya mentioned she was still a journalist when there was the first uh, presidency. This was the time when I was uh, a coordinator or, or rapporteur of the European Parliament for Croatia. And uh, she was uh, not an easy journalist, I must say. She was always uh, very fair, I would say from today. So maybe one of the questions would of course be to, to Tanya from my side, how she sees the relationship between uh, Slovenia and Croatia, because it was always, let's say in a way, um, hurting oneself if one saw two neighboring countries too, I like very much that, that they have been this, this relatively minor conflict, but of course, if you are, um, uh, affected, you see it perhaps as a bigger conflict, but th that would be one question. The other question, of course, is, and that was also mentioned by the foreign minister of Slovenia, is this informal uh, meeting of uh, the Balkan uh, countries or the Balkan summit. So there would be, of course, the, the question, what could be the result of it? The minister said uh, he is in a result oriented. He wants to go and approach uh, the uh, Balkan summit uh, in a result oriented way, not in, not in a problem oriented one. So um, in fact, it is uh, um, positive, this attitude, but the question is what could be the result be? Is the result to have at least some progress only with the two countries where we still uh, looking forward, Albania and uh, North Macedonia. Is it perhaps some new dynamic to give uh, the Balkan uh, uh, integration process? Uh, so that, that will be interesting to, to know. Uh, and maybe also from, from Tanya, but how you see it in the European Parliament? Many people are despaired, are disappointed, of course. Uh, uh, Minister Osmani from North Macedonia expressed this uh, disappointment very strongly, and I know that the European Parliament is, is uh, also with your help, Tanya, is, is in a positive attitude. But I think it's, it's still very, very critical, and, and the people are disappointed, and I can understand it. They fulfill things, and then nothing comes. On another issue, where you also were working very much, uh, of course, on the, on the visa, uh, liberalization, which is still open with, with the Kosovo, not that they have been uh, not also responsible, for, at least for the delay, but uh, in some way the feeling that promises have been made and they are not fulfilled is uh, in the region, uh, you know, dominant, maybe exaggerated sometimes, maybe covering the mistakes the countries do themselves. So my, my two uh, Dear question to Daniel would be the relationship between Slovenia and Croatia. It would be good if they, if they are as good as the ministers presented it. And the second is, of course, what could uh, the informal summit uh, present as a result, as the minister said, he wants to approach uh, the summit uh, result oriented. Shall I immediately? Okay, thank you, Hannes. Now, first on the relations between Slovenia and Croatia, uh, it's a little bit a joke, but it's quite uh, true that during the summer and during the winter a holiday break are excellent because uh, a lot of Slovenes love to go to Croatia for the sea and a lot of Croats like to go to Slovenia for winter skiing. Um, apart from that, of course, we have a, a lot of bilateral issues that burden our relations, but I would also say that 
it's uh, better than it used to be, at least when we were discussing years ago, you mentioned arbitration agreement on the um, um, border um, dispute and how to settle our border. At that time, it was very tense. We had an arbitration uh, um, judgment at the end of the day that one side, Slovenian side, endorsed it and Croatian not. Now it's more a period of uh, quiet diplomacy between the leaders of the country. So it's not uh, a topic that would really burden our relations or that would be sensitive or much um, discussed among the societies. Um, now we are maybe seeing more um, um, efforts to open the border because Croatia, you know, is trying to enter Schengen. Schengen, on the other hand, is facing itself a lot of challenges. I'm dealing with the reform of Schengen area for a few years now. And uh, knowing that Bulgaria and Romania still has joined, even though they met the criteria years ago, I'm afraid that Croatia will face the same challenges until we don't reform the Schengen system as a such. Um, and we try to support here Croatia's efforts uh, because it's in interest of our citizens on both sides of the border that we try to facilitate their travel. And that, of course, we have the safe outside um, European border. So I would say here, um, currently, the relations are really good. And especially if you talk to people on both sides of the border, then um, you don't see any, any tensions. Um, the other is, of course, um, when we go further in the region of the Western Balkan, you rightly say, I, I also feel the same. There is um, growing skepticism, um, growing maybe even nationalism or despair. And young generation is leaving the countries. They don't have clear perspectives and enlargement is uh, losing uh, the true, not momentum, but also positive energy. Even though we say that we really put it back on the agenda after some maybe year or two of vacuum, um, I feel that not many people truly believe that much will happen in the coming year. And that is because we were delivering promises on both sides maybe, but if I look on European side, and if I look in the case of North Macedonia or Albania, then it's really justified that Euroscepticism, because from our side, we didn't deliver, whether it's Bulgarian veto or before something else. In case of North Macedonia, this is really very painful history for so many years trying to negotiate to access, and it's only about negotiate to start the accession negotiations for more than 12, 13 years, this is a very bizarre thing. So as I myself, a, a shadow rapporteur for North Macedonia, um, I would really say that um, it's very irresponsible what Bulgaria is doing. And I hope we recalled or we called several times uh, the, the authorities that they should withdraw veto. So when you ask me what I feel or what I see that would be a success of Slovenian presidency, would certainly be that we really start the accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania by the end of this year. Uh, this is, I think, really the priority of Slovenian presidency. I would add a personal one that you mentioned. Um, Kosovo is still in a black hole of the Western Balkan as regards the visa-free travel for the citizens of Kosovo. And I remember I was also a rapporteur for this country that um, the proposal to grant uh, visa-free travel for Kosovo citizens was adopted by European Parliament already in September 2016. So now imagine how difficult it is to explain to, to people in Kosovo if he endorsed it, the Commission endorsed it, and now it's five years later we are still discussing it and the member states cannot politically agree whether um, to abolish visas for Kosovo citizens. So we will have to make more efforts on our side to be more truly committed. And I sincerely believe as Western Balkan has always been part of Europe, it's part of Europe and will stay part of Europe, that we today maybe even more need each other than before. 
and we have somehow to work hard hand in hand to bring these countries closer to you. We should not fall asleep and we should not put enlargement um, in, on the margins of the political agenda. That is why I'm, as I said at the beginning, glad to see that our presidency um, will deal with the Western Balkan summit. If there is some new dynamic in the process, I think we've seen some new dynamic with changing uh, some um, steps of the accession process um, after France had um, difficulties already in the previous round, um, giving the green land to North Macedonia. But I'm afraid if this year we will not achieve progress, then we will um, next year have bigger challenges when France will take over the presidency. So it's a, a good chance that we do some progress. And I strongly believe my country has a very unique opportunity to contribute to the realization of European perspective of all countries in the region. And we know the region pretty well. So I do hope that um, we will fulfill these expectations. Thank you. I think you mentioned that there is also uh, the citizens are a little bit losing hope in, 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 in what, the, what the process actually brings them in the long term. But there is also, on the other hand, there is also skepticism towards the rural enlargement from a European side, from head of states. I mean, we know that Macron wants the, for example, wants the process to be different. So first, a, a reform of the European Union before we even keep on talking about enlargement on the one hand. This is probably also in line with backlashes, which we are witnessing within the European Union. And you were mentioning the report about Slovenia just um, in, your, in, your, in your first uh, statement. So my question would be, how realistic do you see something like a post-accession conditionality mechanism after European Union accession to actually ensure that European values are guaranteed even after membership. Do you think this is feasible? I think we should introduce that long time ago for certain member states in EU, because if we would today test um, their readiness of meeting um, our criteria, economic or political or European values, we see that in many countries, this is not the case. Um, Hannes before mentioned Hungary and Poland, where we have two countries in EU that both have Article 7, which means that because of their um, difficulties or breaking the um, or constitution or fundamental rights or democracy, they are in process of being scrutinized and at the end of the day, they might even lose the voting right. Um, so we see that, but at the end of the day, the commission or the governments don't have a political strength or strong instruments to really invoke such um, mechanism to punish the countries in EU. Now we are discussing what else can we do? Shall we take the money away, you know, the discussion you to linkage um, the respect to fundamental rights and values um, to how much money we still give to countries such as Hungary or Poland that are biggest net um, uh, receivers. Now, so it's difficult to imagine after post enlargement feels so far to, to, to talk. Um, but certainly we, we are establishing this mechanism, but once you have, a, I go back to the case of Hungary or Poland, when you have in the council political families and alliances, when they start um, um, protecting each other, you cannot introduce such mechanisms. So we will have to really thoroughly think how to um, ensure that our values are respected today in EU, in member states, but of course also uh, for the new ones to come. But we shall not bring new difficult conditions to the accession process, because each time we have new enlargement, there are new conditions and it's becoming more and more challenging for the new countries of the Western Balkan also to approach you. If you just think that you are negotiating for 15 years, like North Macedonia, to start the accession talk, then one can easily imagine why they are losing hope. 
Thank you. Um, Hannes, maybe also if you would like to, to reflect on what Tanya has been saying, but maybe you can also, since uh, I know that you always have been in, in favor of uh, accession of the of the Western Balkan states, and you have been working there a lot also when you still were in the parliament, but maybe you can explain a little bit, because it's, it seems to be very a blunt question, but, but why would the European Union profit from a closer integration of the Western Balkans into the European Union? Well, uh, first of all, what Tanya said about uh, Poland and Hungary or any other country who may come into that position, uh, I think at least the European Parliament uh, insisted on some mechanism concerning the, the finances. That was uh, uh, not an idea of the Council, uh, of course, uh, and um, even if it is very difficult to, to make it uh, practical and to implement it, in case uh, there is a clear violation, uh, at least the threat alone was uh, giving uh, some headaches uh, to Mr. Orban and to, the, to Mr. Kaczynski or whoever was representing uh, Poland at that time. The second on the enlargement question, I think um, it's not so much, maybe Tanya can also make a comment on that, uh, because there was a question in debate we just had in Bratislava, is uh, are the countries fearing the Chinese influence? And um, Mr. Lajcek said, no, well, it's, uh, that's a nonsense because China's influence or China's uh, investment is so small um, and uh, in comparison to what the European Union is in investing. Um, Russia is perhaps a bit different, at least in some of the countries like in Serbia, but overall it is true the European Union is investing much more and European Union uh, companies are investing much more than, than Russia and China. Maybe the propaganda or the, uh, the let's say, uh, public uh, publicity given to the different investment and measures is, is different. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, countries um, who are more, more or less, as was said, included in European Union countries, because it's, uh, let's say, some sort of an enclave, if you want to say, uh, there is always some insecurity coming from there. Uh, we don't know who goes in, who goes out, uh, what is happening there. And it is a bit strange to have this enclave and uh, where um, it is always possible that some insecurity is coming from, even if it, the countries are small, even if the whole population is uh, a minimum of that in relation to the European Union. So I think uh, there are benefits, not so much the economic benefit. I would say the security benefits for the European Union are, are clear, and therefore it is in our interest Migration is one of the issues. Migration um, from the countries uh, will continue, even if it's uh, trying to be prevented, if uh, the economic development of the countries is, uh, is, is weak, and the economic development of these countries will be weak if they are not included in the European market. So I think that's, that's very clear. One idea I may perhaps present here also and, and ask uh, Tanya, because that was over, also discussed briefly uh, in, in Bratislava, is the idea, could there be a phasing in process where the countries can participate already on some of the elements more than now, some elements are already here, can be even sitting at the table, at the table even including perhaps in the parliament without voting rights, as long as they are not members, but that they are more integrated, more involved in these issues. So I think uh, this, it's an idea which is, uh, I think I promoted already for some time. Now there are people who are doing it more in an elaborate way. And the interesting thing is when Mr. Osmani was asked and he said, well, uh, of course, we don't want to give up membership. It must, must be clearly that the target must be fixed. But the process, the way to it could be really in a phasing in process. And of course, value for value. If, you, if, you, if we do our job, then we get another phase. 
If we don't do our job, it stops. So it doesn't say you're a fixed member in six years. Uh, that, of course, would be nonsense. So I think a more phasing in step-by-step -step process uh, so that they are already in their head members of the European Union. That this kind of balancing act, uh, Mr. Vucic is very often, you know, yes, European Union, but maybe it was Russia and so on, has to, to stop. So I think personally, uh, it would be worthwhile and it would be fruitful to discuss it. Of course, legal aspects and so on have to be discussed in detail, but maybe Tanya, uh, you can comment on that. If that, if you think in one could perhaps in the medium term, if we see that membership is not on the table for the next five years, think about such a process, which also could uh, soften some of the arguments uh, in European countries. Well, we don't know what we get if we have uh, membership soon. And maybe this uh, mechanism you mentioned uh, we had in Bulgaria and Romania, uh, could then be starting before and then, of course, continued after full membership. So there are some new ideas and maybe it is worthwhile to think about it. Yes, it's certainly worthwhile to think about uh, that we somehow keep the dynamic further and that they feel they are part of the processes. Now, I'll give one example uh, that recently was on the agenda. Now, when we discuss about the conference on the future of Europe, um, in a moment like this, we cannot fail to involve our partners from the Western Balkan countries because we are together discussing about the future of Europe. And uh, they can once again feel unequally, vocally, and indissolubly part of the great European family. That's why we, during last discussions in the European Parliament, in the process of adopting the annual progress reports on the enlargement countries, called on the Council and the Commission to identify most appropriate instruments to include all the six countries of the Western Balkans in the Conference on the Future of Europe, um, that, as I said at the beginning, has started already on the 9th of May, but it will be ongoing till 2022. But unfortunately, our call was not upheld by the Council. Um, and nevertheless, together with some of my colleagues in the European Parliament, we signed a letter um, to the executive board of the conference calling on them to ensure a real involvement of the institutional representatives and the civil society of the Western Balkans. And specifically, we actually called for inclusion of the political and institutional representatives of the Balkans as uh, permanent observance in the conference uh, um, plenary and all the related bodies and fora, inclusion of civil society, and young people from the Western Balkans in all the European citizens panels and the other discussions for I envisage. And lastly, a proposal for a European citizens panel on EU enlargement. But you can see the mood that the council just in the panels when we are discussing with the citizens for two years on the future of Europe that we are challenged whether they can be permanent observers. So I'm not very optimistic, but we shall certainly push for these ideas as long as we don't do further steps in the enlargement. We have to think out of the box. We have to think out of the box and give citizens a feeling they are part of the process, especially when we discuss about our common future. Thank you for your initiative. That's very, very, very um, exciting what you did. Um, let me come back already because time is already, we're already running out of time. I want to also address uh, questions in the chat which are topic related and there is one question which is also a little bit about this geopolitical dimension within the region and uh, Adichari Magic is asking how do you see the role of the new United uh, States administration regarding the Western Balkans? So this is the first question and the second question he asks is that High Representative Borel presented his uh, communication on Russia yesterday where activities in the Western Balkans were described as hostile. 
He asked, is the European Union ready to respond? Because recently Russia has threatened to veto the extension of the youth mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina at the UN Security Council in November 2021. So do you think that the European Union will be able to overcome this potential veto? So US and um, Borrell and uh, Russia. <laughs> Okay, I will start uh, with the um, United States and new Biden administration. It's good timing because he was just paying the visit to Europe. And I am actually quite optimistic because the United States is committed certainly to ensuring stability under the new administration and security of the Western Balkans, allowing all the countries of the region in the to fulfill potential as free and prosperous democracies. Now, you remember that the Biden administration issued um, executive order, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday or these days, uh, another one that builds on and expands previous one, modernizing the Western Balkan sections regime by including references to 2018 PRISPA agreement and the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. So additional, this new executive order issued just recently provides for sanctions against the persons whose actions destabilize the region by undermining democratic institutions and the rule of law or by violating human rights. So to best address region-wide networks of corruption, Albania has been also added to the scope of this executive order. So it's a, it's a hard tactic they play, but they show also quite seriousness and commitment to, to the region. So I maybe, I wish the, the Europe would have same strong presence and speak with a strong and one voice in the region, because often in the past I felt the the whole region of the Western Balkans in the absence of a strong European enlargement voice is becoming or became a, a playground for different geopolitical strategic interests. And when you see, you know, interference of Russia or China or Turkey in different, I mean, um, the region is um, a variety of um, his different historical backgrounds, different um, ethical backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. So um, it's a very sensitive one. And once different powers are playing um, in the absence of a strong European enlargement policy, it's uh, very dangerous. When it comes to Russia, we were for many years warning um, the, the, especially here I have in mind Serbia to ally the foreign policy with the uh, EU policy. Um, this is often on the agenda, but um, it's nothing wrong when the countries have dialogue with different partners in the world. It's always good to have a dialogue, but it's better to have a clear strategic goal and way forward to where you belong. And the Western Balkans, in my eyes, strongly belong to European Union. Thank you. Uh, if I may, there is another question um, regarding the, the importance of the French presidential elections, which are going to take place in, in, in 22. So the question there is uh, that uh, um, um, so the um, Klaus Pampers assumes that before the French presidential elections are over, probably no decision will be taken by the European Union in the context of enlargement. So where is then the substance of this Western Balkan summit? And it's uh, addressed to you, Tanya. Um, maybe it's also the question for Hannes, but you are right. Um, that's why I don't expect some outcome in October summit, but of course there needs to be preparation. When I said at the beginning that the best outcome would be to start the accession talks with the North Macedonia and Albania, I said by the end of the year, because I'm aware there are elections in two very important countries and especially France is often um, the one that we all know is more reluctant or reserved towards the, the region and the enlargement process. So I do not expect um, uh, major steps ahead of that, but um, um, I do hope that we can prepare well the ground to um, have them positive results till the end of the year. Hannes, if you would also like to comment on, on that. 
it could be that uh, for France it's easier if it is done before the election, the starting, and uh, so they don't have to postpone it again and again after the election. It would be also shown responsibility because we don't know what happens at the election, unfortunately. Um, but you never know, people are not uh, courage, uh, courageous enough, uh, leaders, uh, to, to take this decision. I don't think it will really influence uh, the election in France. There are other issues. It's not uh, uh, Albania. Uh, and uh, in that case, it's more Albania, not uh, North Macedonia. On the other issue, perhaps just a brief remark. Yes, uh, I fully agree with, with Tanya, also the new engagement of the US, of course, is totally different from what uh, we saw from Trump, you know, with this very strange exchange with Israel and so on. Um, and on Russia, uh, I would say important is, of course, to criticize what is wrong on the influence. And uh, we should have much more shown, for example, Russia's role in fighting against the Prespa agreement between Macedonia, North Macedonia and, and Greece in North Macedonia to say, well, this is violating the interests of North Macedonia and then going to the same, uh, uh, about the same issue uh, in pleading in Greece, this is bad because of Greece national interest. So this contradictory, a very simplistic uh, argument from the Russian side. But I think most important is to give strength to Europe. And what Tanya said, a strong European voice is necessary. I doubt that the, um, the commissioner we have now is really the one who can do that best. But anyway, he is the commissioner. And also I would say that the commission president must uh, come into it and give it a strong voice. Uh, I would like in general, but that's an an old issue that commission presidents should have a stronger voice on some of the issues also vis-a-vis -vis the council and also on the Balkan because the fact though and Tanya showed that that's uh, the parliament which is the strongest voice and that also thanks to, to Tanya with her experience and her engagement and some few other members so I think uh, very often uh, and Perhaps nowadays even more than before that the European Parliament is left alone and has not the uh, necessary support by the Commission uh, and uh, of course not by the Council and that, that's a bad thing. But nevertheless, I don't know, we come closer to the end, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, we hope and we must hope that the presidency has some success and that uh, maybe even small elements of progress can be shown at uh, the informal summit because otherwise the despair and the disappointment will grow and grow. Last question from my side. You can you can also answer it shortly. And um, we all know, and um, but many often tend to forget that the European Union actually is based on its values. I mean, they are also we know they are codified in Article Two when it comes to rule of law, democratization, democracy. Um, uh, rights of minorities uh, and so on. So the question would be, do you think that without the EU integration of the Western Balkans, would you say that the European Peace Project, because this is also what the European Union stands for, it's a big peace project, would you say that it is somehow unfinished without integration of Western Balkans? Um, yes, certainly. I mean, we often forget to say that why this integration is um, necessary it's for peace and stability in the region um, it's not self-obvious especially when we see growing tendencies in many countries of not only um, euroscepticism is can be a positive one but a dangerous euroscepticism or a growing nationalism or radicalization or um, destroying european values and democracies or um, freedom so Yes, it's not self-obvious. We'll have to fight for this prosperity and peace in the region. Uh, we are speaking about the region of the Western Balkans that had 20, 30 years ago bloody wars. So they know best how it is if we are not reconciling and working together and prospering on all sides where it can take us. So for that reason, the European values are also important for the especially young generation in the region. What 
really gives me optimism at the end of this debate is that still, when you talk to um, young people in the region, they mostly want to go to European countries. They really see future in Europe. So that means they share our values. They see prosperity and perspective in our countries. Um, therefore, I think we have to work uh, hand in hand, conclude this project, because only bringing all the countries in European continents together, we will also be a stronger player on the international ground and fighting together our global challenges. Thank you very much. I think that was a very uh, nice positive note for the end. If you do not want to add something, Hannes, um, I, I think we can. Very yeah. good. It's always good to have some positive side at the end. So thank you very much, Tanya, for your, for your time. And uh, thank you very much, Hannes Wobot, also for joining. And um, good luck for, for the presidency. And, and we hope to have some positive results, especially when it comes to, to, the, to the Western Balkans, maybe also the Kosovo e uh, visa issue, which is a problem. And thank you so much. And um, have a nice um, rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, best regards from Ljubljana. Yes, Thank you. Best regards from Vienna too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.